Um, well, welcome everyone um, to what is now the second meeting of uh, JFI's Social Wealth Seminar. Um, to briefly introduce uh, myself and, and the organization, um, I'm Paul Katz, um, and I'm VP um, for Special Projects at JFI. Uh, the organization, uh, Jane Family Institute, um, just to say a quick word about it, um, we are a uh, applied research organization in the social sciences, uh, and uh, we have three major focus areas. Um, which are um, higher education financing, uh, alter like uh, alternatives to student debt, um, uh, digital ethics, uh, my brain froze for a second there, digital ethics, and, uh, and finally guaranteed income. Uh, and uh, this social wealth seminar uh, we have conceived of as an ongoing um, bi-weekly forum um, to explore strategies um, for the management of public assets in resources uh, in service of social justice. Uh, in the United States and uh, hopefully across the world. Um, and uh, we're going to be meeting, as I mentioned, uh, every two weeks virtually via Zoom. Uh, if you're here, I suspect it probably means that you're on your email list, on our email list rather. Um, but uh, in, in case you're not, uh, please just uh, send an email to sws-reservations at janefamilyinstitute.org and I'll be sure to add you to the list. It's how we'll be distributing Zoom links and readings um, for our bi-weekly meetings. Uh, I just want to, before introducing um, today's speaker, uh, very briefly plug our upcoming sessions. Uh, so we will be scheduling um, seminar meetings on an ongoing basis, uh, but for the moment, um, we have uh, two more beyond today's meeting that we have already scheduled. Uh, two weeks from today, on Tuesday, August 4th, we'll be hearing from Amanda Cass, who's the Associate Director of the Government Finance Research Center at the University of Illinois, Chicago, who will be speaking about public pensions in the wake of COVID-19. And then two weeks after that, uh, we'll uh, have the pleasure of uh, learning from Carla Santos Scandier, who is the co-manager of the Climate and Energy Program at the Next System Project. And she will be speaking about non-extractive finance mechanisms for just recovery and transition. Uh, also, I just want to um, briefly plug two other things um, uh, that, or I'm sorry, one other thing rather that we, uh, we have at JFI, which is our, our weekly newsletter. Uh, it's uh, distributed every Saturday morning. Uh, and so if you are not currently subscribed, um, it's pretty spectacular. It's actually what drew me to JFI in the first place. Uh, and so I hope that, uh, that you will let me know and I can add you to the subscription. Of course, you can find it yourself on our website. Uh, just a, a quick note about the format for today's meeting. Um, the goal is that we'll go about an hour. Uh, I think we have a, a little bit of flexibility, but, but uh, we'll aim for about an hour. Uh, and uh, we'll be beginning with a presentation, uh, 25, maybe 30 minutes, uh, before moving on to a question and discussion period. Um, so let, we'll ask, because we're going to be devoting so much time to questions and discussion, um, that you please hold your questions, your substantive questions, uh, until the end. Uh, but uh, in the case that you have um, kind of a, an urgent clarification or um, something that needs to be addressed immediately, um, then you can you know, share it in the chat. Um, so I'll be sure to uh, address it there. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, but some of you may have missed, uh, we are recording this session. Uh, so if you uh, would prefer not to be in any way registered, please make sure to have your camera off. And if you have any questions, you can just put them in the chat um, and uh, I'll read them out for you so you don't have to uh, in any way appear um, in, the, in the recording. All right, um, so I think that's enough of a preamble. Um, it is now my, my great pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker, uh, Jakob Fagan. Uh, Dr. Yako Fagan is responsible for developing the research agenda, projects, initiatives, and partnerships for the Future of Capitalism project at the Bergruen Institute. As a core part of the Bergruen Institute's work to develop and promote long-term answers to the biggest challenges of the 21st century, the Future of Capitalism program will work to identify new ideas, models, and mechanisms about how to manage and legitimate market economies. Prior to joining the Bergruen Institute, Yakov was a fellow in history and policy at the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government and managing editor of the Private Debt Project. In these capacities, he conducted and coordinated research into international political economy, financialization, and comparative economic systems. Fagan holds a PhD in history with a focus on economic history from the University of Pennsylvania. His forthcoming book, Building a Ruin, the International and Domestic Politics of Economic Reform in the Soviet Union, will be published by Harvard University Press. 
He has taught courses in international political economy, money and banking, and business history, and held fellowships from the Institute for New Economic Thinking, the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Program, Harvard University, and the University of Pennsylvania. All right, Yokova, I'll pass the baton to you. Well, thank you. I'm going to share my screen just so I have some random lines to refer to um, as I speak. Um, Fantastic. I have no idea why I cannot share it. Hmm. Um, interesting. Oh, there it is. Oh, great. Oh, great. Just as I thought. Okay. Oh, boy. Technical difficulties. Um, would you be able to share the PowerPoint I sent you? Yes, yes, I certainly can. Um, good thing we did that. Uh, meanwhile, I'll start uh, because I don't really need the PowerPoint, honestly. I just, because I literally just got a new computer, so nothing works yet. Um, so uh, the talk I wanted to give today is actually really an expansion and a look into kind of how we've been, I've been in particular framing up the problem of public investment and public ownership within the Bergeron Institute's programs and why we're very interested in things like baby bonds, national investment uh, projects and longer term ways of redirecting investment. Um, I, uh, it actually builds on a piece I kind of published for the Jane Family Institute in Phenomenal World with uh, Dominic Losdar which talks about essentially the demand deformations that you get from having a dollar, uh, essentially a dollar dominated global system. Now, the main thesis we present is that essentially, if you think about it, right? Oh, here we go. Um, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. Okay, sorry. No problem. Um, thank you, that if we think about wealth, right, and its sources in a society, we, GDP is actually, and NIPA in particular, national income product counting, is actually a pretty good guide, right? There's a lot of criticisms of GDP and NIPA for what they don't tell us, but what they do tell us is sources, right? That's their kind of Keynesian origin. And one of the kind of key balancing items, right, is an accounting item for NIPA, and this is just an accounting identity, is the fact that capital accounts and current accounts have to balance, right? A capital account is how much either of investment either comes in and out of your country, and a current account is your trade account, right? In the United States, we argue, we will have a permanent current account surplus because the world likes to use dollars to invoice trade and to save. That means there's always gonna be more demand for dollars than the US GDP area can produce. In turn, that creates certain kind of deformations. And if we just move through, right, uh, to the next slide. Okay, sorry. No problem. There we go. Again, it's my fault, right? You kind of have a global payments hierarchy, right? When you have American dollars, right, the dollars you can carry in your wallet, or deposits which are backed by reserve at the top, they are the most liquid, they are always there for means of payment, but they have pretty low yields, right? At the top of this uh, hierarchy. And then you have these bottom middle layers, right? Where you have treasury repo, which is just repositioning, which is kind of the cash for large financial institutions, right? To meet interday funding requirements. They use US treasuries mostly at the safest as collateral to secure short-term loans. You have private dollar repo, for example, which is the same thing except using private collateral. Euro dollar deposits, which are dollar deposits and receipts essentially in non-US banks, so they're not back to the Federal Reserves. You have other forms of dollar debt that can be collateralized. Then you have regency currencies, regional currencies, for example, the Euro is a big one. You have some places that have a lot of uh, yen transactions, which are uh, which have the exact same structure underneath them. And then you have your local currencies, right? Which are kind of, which are going to be your national economy. But at the top of this hierarchy as a means of payment, you really need access to dollars and particularly private dollar collateral, right? Um, if you look at global trade, about 80% of global transactions have a dollar leg somewhere involved, right? If you go to the next slide, um, 
you can kind of see that quite nicely in the composition of reserves. They're pretty stable and dom dollar dominated, right? Um, you don't really, you see some Euro, but other than that, the bands are really small. In fact, there was a really funny article that talked about, you know, the rise of the Chinese RMB because it's, I think was, they said the fourth largest currency transaction. Well, it's not that much compared to the volumes. But what we argue is that creates a certain problem for the American economy. We call it, we call it politic, uh, financial Dutch disease, right? Our economy is incredibly dependent on exporting dollar collateral to the rest of the world. There's an unsatiated demand. And interestingly, because of liquidity preference, right, within the need for this kind of collateral, the worse the economy gets, the more there's demand for dollars, right? Because you want to pay off your debts in real currency rather than in other forms of debt. Now, what this does means is the U.S. can never export its way into growth anymore, but it also means there's a lot of private capital flowing into assets, and assets need to be created. Now, the reason we call this Dutch disease, right, is we use a political definition of Dutch disease, which is that, well, first of all, let's cover what Dutch disease is, right? Um, just assuming I don't know what level of people are on, but within the within our definition of Dutch, essentially Dutch disease is a kind of term of art in development economics. It's named after the phenomenon that after, you know, oil was discovered in the North Sea in Holland in the 1960s, the um, the currency in Holland really uh, appreciated uh, causing value-added industries to suddenly lose funding and then consumer industries to become extremely dominant, causing distortions within the social structure. So you had more and more money coming into financial elite and this industries needed to service them. Since then, I think the definition has really changed, which is where I think people kind of get a little confused with the argument. The argument is less that you have a new resource discovered, usually as in the classical story, than as the social structure being changed. The term of art now is that Dutch disease isn't an economic phenomenon. Purely, it's a social and political phenomenon. And because of that, institutions are incredibly important, right, to um, managing it. A really famous institution that has managed Dutch disease in the classical sense, right, with a natural resource, is the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is the oil fund, right? And what that has done is it has taken the rents that are true from this kind of inflow uh, of this capital inflow that comes from a natural resource and has reinvested it abroad in order to back up the uh, welfare state. So already we see that kind of a sovereign wealth institution is extremely effective in managing this kind of problem. Now, if you go to the next slide, I'm actually gonna skip that because that just shows that what, what research is telling us is relative currency strength, which is the, again, the classical Dutch disease story doesn't really work in a dollar funding world um, because there's an implicit kind of what we call a put dollar put, right? In that there will always be a market for dollars that will be created by the United States financial system involved. So that ha doesn't tend to change import export mixes as much as it used to anymore. There's an argument against this that the US dollar was very cheap at some point, but it still had this phenomenon still existed. An argument is it's not relative bilateral currency pair strength. It's actually the way demand has def uh, a demand pulls the global flows in. So the next slide. Um, argument is the US economy actually shows many of the phenomenon associated with the classical resource based Dutch disease. Uh, we have a falling labor share, which we are, are, I'm pretty sure, all familiar with, that the share of income accruing to labor since the, 19, uh, since the 1970s has dramatically fallen uh, on the next slide. But what we are less familiar about, actually, uh, is that the capital share has fallen. So, um, right, it's a little more fluctuating, but the capital... Um, uh, Shima Barkai's uh, research actually shows that it's fallen more radically than the labor share. And by the capital share, I mean the return on investment that a capital, essentially a capitalist puts in to new fixed capital, right? But what has increased on the next slide is the profit share or the rent share, right? Which is the markup that's a, uh, on assets that you can get 
that's really interesting because what this is telling us is there is a massive misallocation of capital coming from the inflows that we see around from global inflows. And because of that, we need to think through kind of new institutional ways to manage that, just as you would in Norway, just as you would in any country with that suddenly strikes oil or any other natural resource, we need to do that with our financial markets and our financial economy. Now, this isn't a new thought. John Maynard Keynes argued that when an economy hits a certain, a certain level of development, there has to be some level of the socialization of finance, right? Of the social, uh, in order to reduce the rent share so that investment and thus full can happen at its optimal rate. And we think that there's a couple of institutions that we need to think about, right? In order to get in to the right structure, in order to build like checks within this flow structure that allows us to reinvest these capital inflows into the United States that come as a result of the US issuing a reserve currency and issuing reserve assets more importantly, in order to put them to work towards more productive uses to fund both social services, but also to fund the development of new generations of technology. Um, and we're not doing that. So if you go to the next slide, one problem is we are, this is real, like the result of this kind of, you know, this distributional issue is our investment rates are really collapsing since the, since the nineties. In, in fact, if you run this back to the seventies, um, you see that investment rates have been collapsing since the 1970s, since we've really moved on to a dollar standard since the late seventies, they had a boost in the 1990s, we argue, because there was a kind of lag effect towards large scale government investment in IT. And that has now dissipated. So we've gotten back to a low growth equilibrium. Um, this problem is actually com compounded by how we've dealt with this issue beforehand. So if you go on to the next slide, um, uh, let's skip this slide. We, uh, we can get around that since we might be short on time. Um, in, our, in a separate paper we, uh, at Ber uh, written by Ber my uh, co-author at Berggruen, Nils Gilman and I, we argue that one problem with the United States, that the way the US has dealt with the problem up to now has been what we call asset-based welfare, right? In which we've, essentially insured one asset for the middle class, and that's housing, right? And by financializing that asset, we've insured at least some lock-in into asset price, the asset inflation that's associated with these global inflows. And that worked pretty decently for a good chunk of US history since the 1970s, since we moved on to the kind of dollar world. Um, but that's begun to fall, uh, fall apart, most importantly, after the 2008 crisis, right, when all this kind of housing-derived collateral began to go south. And if you go to the next slide, but even since then, right, housing-based equity hasn't necessarily been outperforming business equity anymore like it did in the, for uh, some periods of time, right? And if you look at if you looked at our distributional charts over there on the last slide, business equity is actually concentrated into the hands of the top of the income distribution. So what you see in terms of the way we've built our asset distribution system in the United States, we have business equity that's owned by the top of the distribution, housing equity that's owned by the middle, and then no equity for the bottom, right? So we need to really drastically rethink how we have sterilized these inflows and the distributional choices that have already come from them. So um, on to the next slide. So what we have some ideas as to how to kind of socialize uh, investment and that each socialization kind of method needs to come with its own institution. Um, we're working on, the first one is the best well known, best known, and there's actually already legislation on the Hill to do this from multiple kind of senators, and we're hoping we can get something passed in two, uh, after, 20, after 2020 into 2021, it's so a national investment bank. Our design for a national investment bank is essentially to create a bank that issues what we call a um, intermediate asset to the US Treasury. Right now, there's this vast demand for U.S. Treasury debt right around the world, and it's because of the and it's backstopped by the Federal Reserve. Because of that demand, the debt has extremely low interest rates. 
Now, in the search for higher yield, you see a lot of global capital coming into much more speculative uses. Uh, I, like, I like to use the example of all the food delivery apps that, you know, pay terrible wages and suck and essentially, you know, aren't profitable and are still negative cash flow, but yet still keep having more and more capital come into them just because there aren't enough productive opportunities for the capital to be realized, for these large pools of global capital to be realized in dollar terms. So what we'd like a national investment bank to do would be to issue an intermediate asset. This intermediate asset would have a higher yield than the equivalent duration United States Treasury in order to attract global capital investment, but it would also be discounted at the Federal Reserve at a kind of much more penalty rate than the US Treasury. So the investor gets higher yields, but some of the insurance, liquidity insurance of a US Treasury asset that does have a US government backstop. And thus, instead of you know, pushing all that global, all those global savings into speculative uses, we can start restoring American infrastructure, which we think is, especially with green infrastructure, which has about what we think is about 30 to 40 years of underinvestment. So we have a tremendous amount of headroom to invest and create uh, high paying jobs before inflation can kick in, even if, you do, even if you are concerned about inflation, right? If you do believe that a large, large government spending can cause inflation. Um, the nice thing is what we'd like to pair this with is a national venture fund, which would own part of the equity structure of new firms. Now we could fund this in a couple of ways. One would be just exactly through the, and in fact, we think it should be housed under the same institutional roof as a national investment bank. You can fund it within the same kind of uh, equi equity, uh, within the same kind of capital market borrowing, but instead of creating loans into you know, infrastructure utility projects, we believe that the government should be directly investing in new firms and holding that share for, uh, as a kind of, as a resource for uh, future generations that can then generate profits of its own and be reinvested into new generations of firms and technologies. Um, the interest, the other thing we're exploring is actually whether we think that loan development loans from this bank can actually be paid back by private business and equity in order to establish the seeds of a kind of sovereign wealth institution. Independently, there are also proposals that we're not as closely associated with, or at least I'm not, for a equity sovereign wealth fund that would just simply buy out a share of the S&P 500. Matt Brunigue is a very, very big fan of this. Um, I think that's a good idea, but I think what is really important is that some of these rents might not necessarily be captured down towards the individual level but right into reinvestment away from uh, into actual prop into value added in, uh, industries. And finally, we at Bergruen are developing something we call a data in, in industrial policy, and that's its own self standing system. Um, I'm kind of I, I, that would require its own talk, but I want to kind of give a preview of that effort. Um, along with a group of computer scientists, we've, uh, the economics team at Bergruen has been essentially making an argument that we need to treat the large technology firms, particularly ones that are gaining their value added through personal data collection, not necessarily as, well, as monopolies, but as natural monopolies rather than necessarily breaking them up. And that would involve utilitizing them um, and as part of that, we argue for the need to essentially build a national government database, right, for productive data. A really good example, for example, is Zillow, which uses government data for free in order to do its valuation. And we think for-profit firms should maybe pay for that, but also kick back some of their proprietary data. And there are ways to keep that data safe. Uh, we're actually working with former DARPA director on the technology for that to create a common resource pool to draw on and thus increase both competition, but also capture some of the revenues that are coming in from inflows in the information technology sector, which is right now the most, um, uh, the sector with the highest amount of uh, global inflows that we see and redirect some of those inflows into other industries or into building particularly public infrastructure for information. Um, and as I've said, that could be, if anyone is interested in that, we can talk about that, but it is a fourth institutional option. 
Uh, how much time did I use? I'm sorry. I... Oh, only about uh, 18 minutes. So please oh, keep going. Right. Yes. I'm actually way ahead of time. Um, so I could talk about any of these much more, but I would rather just have some sets of questions out there uh, first in order to, you know, just expand the conversation and see if we can f how we can frame our idea of social wealth within this kind of within the particularities of the Amer globalized American economy. Okay, well, fantastic. Um, thank you so much, uh, Yakov. I, I think um, you've, you've put an awful lot on the table um, and I can't imagine that we're not going to have uh, a number of questions here. Um, you know, I have some myself, but uh, I'd, I'd rather open the floor to others. Um, so uh, if you have a question and uh, feel comfortable asking it yourself and being recorded in the process, um, just indicate in the group chat uh, that you have a question and would like to ask it, and I'll just um, call on you and, and, and invite you to unmute your, or to um, yeah, unmute and, and activate your camera. Uh, if, in contrast, you would prefer not to appear, um, please just type your question in, and I will interpret that oh. as a sign that you would like me to read it. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, open the floor. Um, if anyone has a question, uh, please just note it in the public chat. Okay, I see uh, Herman Schwartz <laughs> has a question, actually two. Um, so let's uh, find you here in the... Would you guys okay. mind if I turn my camera off because my internet connection is terrible? Uh, well, I mean, if, if you feel like it's going to be difficult with it um, off um, or with it on, then, then I suppose, I guess my, my preference would be if, if possible to, um, Let, to keep it on. Try. Okay, let's try it. I'm seeing it coming in. Okay, uh, great. And and I'll just ask, by the way, um, when you ask a question, I think this was a, a good suggestion from our, our first meeting. Um, when you ask a question, please introduce yourself, you know, just with a, a phrase or two. Uh, let us know who you are. All right. Um, so, Herman, if you'd like to ask your question. Sure. Hi, Mark Schwartz. Uh, usually I'm oh, working sorry. at the University of Virginia. Um, so I have, two, I have two questions about the socialization of investment. Um, one is that... Um, and they're both intended to be a little provocative, of course. What, one is that we already have, in a way, um, a intermediate bond, which is the mortgage-backed securities and the uh, debt issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These typically carry a yield about one and a half percentage points above um, the 10-year treasury bond. Um, they count as reserves for banks, and um, they are often repoed. Um, but as we saw in 2008, these, uh, uh, the implicit guarantee for these bonds uh, was made explicit. So the, the question would be, what would be different about these invest in infrastructure bonds, aside from the fact that it's infrastructure, which is better than housing, um, and better than single family home housing? And um, why wouldn't the market um, essentially um, fall prey to the same problems with the implicit versus explicit guarantee that the mortgage-backed securities do. The other question is about uh, venture capital funds, and there's two parts to this, sorry. One part is politically, the um, Clinton administration proposed a civilian version of DARPA back in the 90s. Um, it was uh, shot down by the Republicans. So what is it about the current political environment that makes it more plausible now? And the second part of that is, hey, we already have this. Um, I mean, DARPA is only one uh, organization, but the uh, federal government has a huge number of venture capital funds run by specific departments. The CIA, yeah. for example, has a venture capital fund called InQtel. Um, huh. And yeah, there's <laughs> interesting stories there. Um, and um, so again, politically, given that there already are these um, organizations in place, maybe that makes it easier to get something that would be more civilian oriented. Um, yeah, I'll start from the bottom up because actually InQtel is something I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in fact, actually have like spoken to veterans of InQtel about this and as much as they can tell me about their business practices, which they really can't. Um, they've been apparently trying to like proselytize InQtel to other government and agencies with a lot of interest, but they've and uh, and they actually like they even at one point almost had the postal service do it, which I think is incredibly interesting from the stories I've heard. Um, one problem again is that the advantage InQtel has, I think, is they have a black budget that no one knows about, so they don't actually raise capital on the capital market. 
right? Um, the Postal Service would have to find some way to raise capital in the capital markets, and it's just not as efficient for all of these kind of civilian, uh, both all of these venture funds to kind of work that way. And in fact, in what we're in the report I'm uh, developing, actually, we think that it would be more efficient to have a national investment authority that at least does some of the coordinating functions for all these civilian funds uh, in it, because like a lot of times they're even competing with each other, we've realized. Like, for example, DOE and InQtel constantly compete and don't have a investment strategy. And uh, it's just very hard for that to cross borders, but they do have advantages of they know some of the needs. So I think one of the interesting things is to, what we can do with these is to separate capital management from uh, finding specific projects. And that would just be a re just on a, it's kind of a no brainer that even Republicans kind of would probably, I think go along with that's the easy one because it's just, it, it, it's sort of very, once you begin to explain the scope of this, of just how much the federal government actually does venture in, A, we don't get anything back from it because it's too you know, decentralized, B, it's not very effective. We could do way better. Um, so I agree. Um, as for the intermediate asset, here's where I think we need some policy work to make these work better. Um, Fannie and Freddie are exactly the kind of intermediate assets we kind of want on some level, but are also incredibly symptomatic of some of the ways we haven't actually done collateral issuance very well and that we had an implicit backstop, but not an explicit one. And that's kind of made it very hard to target the rates on these and target the issuance uh, demand. Um, one thing that I would like to see in the design of an intermediate asset would be for one, the Fed to also formalize the reverse repo window, which is the thing it does all the time whenever there's demand on the treasury market, right? It sets up a specific window for the re reverse repoing or the buying essentially for real cash of US securities, right? Um, what's kind of interesting is they could probably just do that through the discount window, but there's a very strange regulatory stigma associated to it. Uh, but what that would do would be to create a known discount rate for the real deal US Treasury, right? And then based of that, off of that discount rate, to establish a, pe a higher penalty rate for the higher yield you get for the intermediate security, right? And I think that particular institutional configuration would probably lend a lot of like stability towards even capital markets. And it is kind of, it's, it's kind of interesting, again, you were coming back to the politics of it all, right? There probably would be some, it, it's kind of interesting. I think some lenders would not mind this thing existing. Mm -hmm. Some might not, and it would probably, as we talk about politics, split the financial lobby in half. I know that some of the smaller infrastructure bank proposals had that effect is where like the uh, like some of the smaller actually local lenders hated it because it would probably take their some of their business which isn't necessarily always efficient but some of the bigger ones were actually oh this is great this is collateral we can make secondary markets here um which is exactly what we want I think out of this right is this kind of counter cyclical stabilizing institution that works autonomously from the fiscal process um, yeah, um, that's, I, I'm not sure if I covered all your questions with where this is, but th this is actually in a fair, I think in a fairly advanced stage, as I said, I think we could see this in 2021 forward if the, if like the Democrats take over, I think there's a lot of political interest here. Oh, and it's different from the Clinton years, I think partially because COVID. Mm -hmm. it, I think on two levels. One is COVID's really changed the conversation about spending. And two is actually, we have less, the expansion of the left has helped a lot on one level, but it's also the acceptance of this kind of thing on the left as an instrument where the first infrastructure investment bank actually was proposed by Bob Delaney and John Kerry of all people. It got a lot of pushback from the progress, initially from the progressive caucus because the word bank was there and it was seen as a something that would like give Wall Street extra hooks in. And that hostility has, you know, dissipated completely and in fact yeah so i think we're 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 at a pretty interesting time now politically 
Actually, you know, if, if I may just indulge myself, actually, um, and, and, and ask a question, um, uh, sort of apropos of that, of that last comment, uh, Yaakov, um, you know, what, what is it you, you think that makes the suite of proposals you've put forward necessarily kind of progressive proposals? Um, you know, what, what, you know what, what, what is it, for instance, that um, would push back against um, the um, kind of rent capture that I think you conveyed so effectively in those three, um, three graphs that you showed us? Well, you know, progressivity is a matter of expanding, I think, the wage share in the end, the share to people who work and to guarantee income to working people. Um, I'm a big fan of guaranteed income. That's something um, like I obviously am a fan of, and I actually think some of these things can eventually be some of the funding base for that. Um, one thing we could even think about, which we are playing with with some local pilots, is actually to have these investment institutions or have guaranteed savings accounts attached to them for every American to make it easier to administer basic uh, guaranteed income. I just don't, don't want to necessarily cover that because that's not in the scope of what I wanted to get on. Um, in terms of progressivity, it is redistributing rent down towards productive capital and workers in particular, right? One of the problems we have with actually raising wages is that the US is extremely under capacity in its investment. And if you have low levels of capacity, right, you're obviously seeing a ton of return to assets, but you're also lowering the negotiating position of individual workers because the economy isn't running hot enough that you can leave your job for another one. So the secondary knock-on effect to this would probably be to increase wages, which would eventually hit us up with inflation, but that would be a very good thing since we have no inflation, partially because we are so unequal and that asset inequality in the end is why we A, don't have investment, and B, because we don't have investment, it's very hard to, you know, to bring up the negotiating power of workers, even if you have strong unions, it's very hard, right? Oh, thank you. That, that, that's very helpful. Um, so I see it. Now we've got some, um, some questions accumulating here in, in the chat, which is uh, always exciting to see. Uh, so Will, uh, Will has two questions. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself also, ask them. Um, hey guys, my name is Will. Uh, I work for Google X out in Silicon Valley. So I guess my first question is kind of related to uh, the idea that we are underinvested in the US. If you think about kind of the classic VC landscape out here, a lot of VCs, given valuations, would say, like, actually, there aren't that many good deals. There's plenty of dumb money out there tracing good deals. Look at the tech companies. They have tons of cash on their balance sheets. Mm -hmm. um, if you're saying we're kind of under investment, like, where, where are you kind of seeing the opportunities that are currently not being invested on? And why do you think the companies that have this cash aren't taking advantage of it? Um, we can maybe for, do that one first. And then I have a question about kind of tax policy and, like, how you think about taxes relative to these social investment schemes. Um, yeah, sure. I mean... So in terms of the ca like global cash pool issue, right? Um, I will guess at the bottom, there's a really wonderful paper by Zoltan Poznar, who is this like guru of the shadow marking sector. He's now at Cardit Suisse, but before he was at OFR. And he pointed out that we have very large receipts that are in dollars from global trade that are hanging out often in tax shelters. Um, that's again, its own issue that are looking for what he would call validate what i would call validation right because you can't put three million dollars in a bank account into an fdi insured fdic insured bank account that just doesn't happen so you need to look at an alternative storage method which means you know investing them into something that carries an interest rate that isn't cash there's this myth that these money flows don't come back into the US, right? That you need a tax holiday to get them to come back. That's just absolutely not true. Um, if I'm Apple and I have a $3 million account, say in the Cayman Islands or wherever, I'm still investing them in the United States because I'm buying dollar assets. At best, I'm buying United States treasuries, but if there aren't enough out there, I'm looking for alternative investments with a, with a, that bring me similar or higher yields. So I'm either lending that cash out to get it, so I'm lending it out to someone, right? And that often will wind up in the Silicon Valley VC system. It's just not set as a, 
it doesn't look like it's coming back into the U.S. from kind of the point of view of the borrower, but from the point of view of the investor, they're very much putting it back into the U.S., which is why I kind of think that the tax holiday thing is somewhat ridiculous and doesn't work um, because it's invested anyway. Um, and yeah, well, you mentioned the VC dumb money. Like, again, that is the Posnar story. You have a lot of loose capital without a lot of opportunity for quick realization. And that's why it's very easy. And that money is looking for quick realization, right? Interest rate payments. So it's very easy to fund a sandwich delivery company, which has some possible cash flow in the future that's speculative, but at least is there. But it's very hard to find the patient capital, right? In order to invest in, say, new energy generating capacity. And the state back stuff is really important there. Right. So, so Yakov, sorry, just to follow up on that really quickly, Paul. So, just to be clear on the answer to that, your view is basically the 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 undercapacity will tend to look a little bit more like an infrastructure investment. It's longer horizon, and it requires sort of patient, more patient capital um, to realize it, and that the government is best positioned to do that. So, so your answer to the question about thinking in insurance, right? Yeah, Policy of that investment. Okay, very helpful. Um, so then the next kind of piece there, though, is like we think about kind of these these cash flows going to tax tax shelters. You think about also equity is in many ways is like kind of a claim on cash flows from the company, which is also what taxes are. So how do you think about kind of like tax policy in relation to these forms of institutional like uh, socialization of wealth? And well, how do you think about like doing the reform agendas, you know, in serial and parallel? How, how do they relate? I mean. I think taxes are gen on wealth assets are generally good. Um, you know, I, as I've said, I'm a, I think wealth taxes are a good idea, especially, you know, sales of portion taxes to get around the problem of, you know, capital, uh, the problem of tax shelters. I mean, I, I support them. I'm not a specialist in them. I, don't think that much about them, honestly. I leave that to people who understand tax policy far better than I do. Uh, I'm interested in the evolution of institutions. But, um, you know, one interesting thing would be to have, you know, if I'm kind of just writing this off the back of my head, there have been a couple of interesting proposals that I'm not sure I always agree with. One is just a capital inflow tax, right, uh, that Mike Pettis proposes, I guess, that would, like, charge a tax on the purchase of a U.S. asset from abroad. I'm not necessarily sure that's a good idea because I think that would mean a lot of collateral making gets pushed into these kind of gray zones like it did during the 2008 crisis. You know, but I think attached with carrots, that might work. You know, um, I think in general, we should be the U.S. should be giving a lot more carrots to, you know, its foreign counterparties, for example, guaranteeing swap lines in exchange for good behavior on, you know, trade balances and things like that. And that could work in combination with the tax. It's not really my area. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I see we have um, questions also from um, Steve Waldman. Um, so if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself and, and ask them. Sure. Hi. So... First, um, Yako, it's wonderful to meet you. It's it really is, great to meet you in person, living legend. Um, well, I, I would say likewise. Uh, so to introduce myself, I sometimes write the blog Interfluidity. I think that's really my own, my only relevant claim here. Um, so first, it was, you know, unsurprisingly, a great talk. So thank you for it. Um, I, I had two questions. One is just to really clarify um, the first question of Michael Schwartz's, um, your response to that. With respect to the intermediate assets that you're proposing, um, listening to your response to how they would be different from sort of tacitly guaranteed agencies that eventually, you know, become fully guaranteed, it sounded to me, but I just wanted to clarify if it was right, that what you were proposing was basically a, um, a discount schedule, or if we wanted to put it differently, a, a, a price schedule, mm -hmm. and that effectively the assets would be guaranteed, but they would be, the private holders would effectively have a put option to the government, but the put option would have a lower floor than treasuries would. Is that a fair characterization? That's exactly it. In fact, one another way we could do it, which I was, I think is just too complicated, but I 
had someone at a talk like this propose is just to swap them for treasure for real treasuries at a discount rate and then repo them again. But that just sounds like an extra step. Okay. Too complicated, but it would essentially be the exact same thing. It's a put option. Right. So those economic sounds really similar. So good. That's that's you know, it's a very clear it's a very clear and simple thing, I think, that way. Um, and then the second question is a little bit broader, um, although the, the prior question I touched on it. So when we talk about Dutch disease, um, we can sort of divide, you know, the, the sort of malaise into two sets of symptoms. Like one is sort of this, distribu this domestic distortion of everything, um, where sort of people close to where the money is coming from get really rich and then other people end up going from productive industries to industries that serve those people. Um, and I think that your proposals go a long way towards addressing that aspect. Um, the, the second aspect of Dutch disease though, that's often talked about is just sort of the international terms of trade aspect that um, you know, oftentimes the, the price of tradables in the domestic economy becomes uncompetitive relative to rest of the world, it looked like the institutions that you're proposing that we kind of divert the rent of our Dutch disease into would largely invest domestically. Do you have any thoughts about how we might address some of the, ter the terms of trade issues? Yeah, well, the terms of trade issues are incredibly complicated, especially with like, the, actually, it's really timely. After I wrote this like slide proposal, a new IMF uh, report came out literally the hour afterwards uh, with, uh, actually talking about the problem of terms of trade when you're everyone's invoicing in dollars, which displayed the problem way better than the slide I, the BIS slide I put in. One of the interesting things they're finding, right, is that when you're in, because everyone is invoicing in dollars, right, everyone has a put option on US consumption. So changes in actual currency rates, right, bilateral effects rates, don't seem to affect trade at all, right? What they interestingly do affect, they affect imports, which if you think about it through Mike Pettis's point of view, which I clearly really like and admire, though I often, some things I agree with, don't agree with him, some things I do, dollar invoicing allows you to turn up essentially financial repression in while uh, in order to offset your problem, in order to offset whatever like, whatever um, hit you're getting on the FX rate so you can continue to export. Now, I think that's actually, I actually, my bias is this, that is a property of capitalism. I think there's always, for a stable global capitalist system, there has to be a put option somewhere. Um, and that's just gonna be the United States for the foreseeable future. Um, and I'm not sure we can change those terms of trades directly. So we might as well lean into them. Um, one, I think, pretty interesting way of, if we do want to go that path, is essentially to, and this will, again, step on a lot of Federal Reserve toes, but is to preemptively link the guarantee, swap guarantees, right? If people, just for everyone knows, might not be as into this stuff as I think some of the people are on the call is the Federal Reserve often issues these uh, in emergency access to dollars, real high power dollars in exchange for your currency and they swap them back. It's an accounting trick, but it's a very effective one. Um, the, there's really no logic to how these things are issued or not. Um, I think if I were, you know, in charge of American policy, I would say that when we do a free trade agreement, which I think we should do, we should guarantee swap line access in an emergency in exchange for certain macro prudential policy within the treaty. One of those being, um, one of those being maintaining uh, multilateral uh, trade uh, surpluses at an acceptable level. I think that's good for everyone, honestly, because I think that also means that other countries aren't investing into their populations as much as they could because they're keeping their wages down, if in effect. And I think that would be a much gentler, more constructive way of dealing with the problem uh, rather than tariffs, which don't work at all, or even a capital import tax, which I think 
would create a lot of financial instability and just would shift things abroad. Because again, I do think that this is a, I, I'm, I, I'm interested enough in Kindleberger enough to think that this is a feature of modern capitalism and it's someone who's required to carry that burden to make it work. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. And it's great to meet you. Uh, so we're currently wide open for additional questions. Uh, oh, uh, never mind. Uh, Sarah uh, Berger Gonzalez has, uh, has just jumped in. So, um, Sarah, would you uh, like to take it? There we go. Hold on. Um, I'm Sarah Berger Gonzalez. I'm with the Stanford Basic Income Lab. Um, and I am. Um, uh, I worked at the World Bank for um, over a decade um, on um, income support programs. Um, and I'm really grateful for this presentation. Um, one question I had, and I know I'm sort of in the basic income, guaranteed income space right now, so we talk a lot about pilots. But one thing I've been thinking a lot about, um, in particular as I think sometimes federal changes are seeming um, not impossible, but very large, and our systems are very slow and old. Um, and I, I wonder if, I mean, I think some of these um, ideas of creating a national investment bank um, or an equity sovereign wealth fund are super interesting. And given the, um, that some of the states in the United States have very large GDPs, would there be interest in sort of piloting at more of a local state level or a city level um, some of these ideas? Because I think from a from an income, I, I feel like I've been in this space where we talk about income and income and income, and I keep saying we should be talking about wealth and wealth and wealth, and both together we can't be decoupling the two. Um, and I so I wonder if there's an opportunity to to pilot this locally and what oh, the, boy, what is, that is, your vision is and look and looks like. Oh boy, is there one right? Um, so I can't get into a lot of detail, but I am trying to put together a pilot in Southern California for a version of this. Now, one of the problems of doing it locally is we can't get the federal backstop, which is key to getting all this to work because that's how you get the liquidity. And, but, um, you know, there is now a pilot in the UK in Camden to try to do this in Camden Borough that Mariana Mazzucato of UCL is running. And we're trying to bring that to, in particular, we have interest from Culver City um, and I'm also talking some other LA area municipalities to charter a regional housing bank. And I think that would be really interesting um, that we can now do that legally because we've passed the legislation in California to allow municipalities to charter banks either individually as a group um, last year. So I think, you know, you can take your tax receipts, right? Lever them up like any bank would and, you know, direct them towards specific goals, like, you know, co-investing at a low rate in affordable housing to bring, bring the entry kind of a private capitals entry uh, costs lower. So you can then guarantee like say 10% of the units become affordable. Um, that would be really useful where I think it's might be, we should probably talk offline uh, is one thing I know there is a private foundation that's interested in doing guaranteed income at the as a pilot at the LA level. And what I've been trying to do is actually to marry the two projects because, you know, as there was a really good paper, actually, Steve at JFI put out, it says we need to build the helicopter, right, to drop it. One instead thing one alter one the the way most of the pilots that I've seen them have been worked worked as is they issued debit cards right but those debit cards are still housed within the public uh, the private financial system so you're giving people reserves to invest in however way they want what I would like to see is those you know if we do spin this local public bank up that it also have savings accounts for people to in order to target guaranteed income schemes. And I think that would be really great. Um, in fact, like in my fantasy world of like the Grand American National Investment Authority, it, everyone has an account in it. And if we hit our capacity on productive infrastructure and we're coming towards inflation, 
we just issue checks in order to everyone in order to increase consumption at the not of uh, non-durables and thus head off some of the inflation, right? And we kind of there that could be built. I mean, there's actually an algorithm you could, I think, pretty well build in there, but I'm not sure that's a political possibility for now, but maybe in the future. <laughs> but I, yeah, I think that it's like the two are obvious partners. Great, and I, you know, I think I would be respond. Uh, I would be guilty of, of professional malpractice if I did not abuse my um, my privilege as, as moderator to note that actually um, two of the cities with which um, JFI is collaborating in Brazil, um, the cities of Marica and Niteroi outside of uh, of Rio, um, have both launched uh, their own sovereign wealth funds. Um, both of them are actively exploring um, the opportunities um, that exist to um, use those funds, the revenues. Um, uh, to um, you know, actually invest um, in economic diversification, and in the case of Marty Ka, in um, the largest basic income program in Latin America. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that that is in fact the origin of um, of I think our our uh, interest in convening the social wealth seminar. Uh, and so uh, you know, I'm very excited to to hear this conversation um, about uh, you know uh, parallel projects in the United States. Well, could I ask you a question about that? Actually, yeah. are they using just the proceeds to back? the uh to essentially just charge and give people like money almost as a dividend or are they actively like use it or are they actively reinvesting the proceeds until drawn well i mean so i, I mean, mean that might be a little too in the ballpark for this discussion but i think that's a really good question how you optimize that yeah yeah well i mean i think that these these are kind of um, ongoing um topics of interest for both of these cities the funds are quite new um both have been created in the last two years in the case of marnica i think one of the major um, uh, projects is a microcredit uh, program that's actually paid in a local currency, uh, the Mambuka, which is uh, yeah, yet yeah, another uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, kind of yet, yet another dimension there. Um, but uh, you know, certainly one one thing that unites um, both cities is their interest in uh, using uh, these uh, these funds for credit guarantees. And certainly, reducing mm -hmm. cost of capital is a major um, priority, I think, for both. Um, in fact, though, there are uh, you know many on this call who could um, speak to this. Um, uh, more uh, more effectively than I can. Um, so if anyone would like to, of course, feel feel free to jump in. Um, but I also just want to um, uh, to you know uh, put out one last call for questions. Um, we're at 7:02, but I think we certainly have time for another uh, question or two. Um, if anyone would like to um, put their virtual hand up. Okay. Well, um, I will uh, then take the um, the lack of a, an immediate response as a suggestion that um, we all really do love the idea of a one-hour uh, seminar meeting. Uh, oh, oh, Leandro, Leandro, I see your hand is up. Okay, uh, yeah, please introduce yourself and uh, and 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 uh, and yeah, take the floor. Oh, thank you, Paul. Uh, really good, uh, Yako. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I'm Leandro. I'm from Brazil. I'm the head of the Brazilian Basic Income Network here. And uh, I was really interested uh, when you mentioned you actually have something in Capitol Hill about this uh, first option you mentioned. Uh, I'd like to hear more about like uh, how's the polit political uh, movements or you know uh, people that are engaged into it in terms of politics because uh, here uh, what Paul mentioned about the sovereign funds in municipal level they had a very uh, strong. Uh, role played by the mayors themselves uh, that were engaging into it. Uh, so perhaps uh, if you know something about uh, political movements and political actors, stakeholders that are engaged into it, I would like to know about it in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, I think it's become incredibly interesting. Like, I, I think especially when it comes to sovereign wealth funds rather than banks, it's there. There seems to be like a lot of interest in California, and that's. The reason, honestly, is our tax structure is terrible. Um, we have something called prop. Like, just if you want to talk about the local politics of it, is we have something called Proposition Thirteen, which is the third rail of our politics, and it is killing the state uh, because we essentially what Proposition Thirteen does is it doesn't let us collect property taxes ever uh, by locking in very old rates. So, like, people are paying like infamously, you know, like. Taxes like it's there from living in 1972 on a property that's worth millions of millions of millions of dollars. And because of that, our tax base is really bad. So everyone is looking for kind of a 
alternative way of raising revenue that doesn't depend on uh, real estate taxes, which we can't collect, which is what most states in America are dependent on. We, as I keep joking with this like real estate kind of social wealth model we've built in America, it just doesn't work anymore for anyone. And it's now so distortionary that everyone, especially here in California, we are looking for an alternative to it. Like that's where I think the political interest comes from, even like amongst the quote unquote moderates, right? They see this as a way of not touching the tax structure, which is really slightly interesting and slightly disturbing to me, but yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, uh, I guess uh, last last opportunity. Uh, any any final questions? Um, the next five seconds or so. All right. I uh, have a quick. Oh, yes. Oh, go. Sorry. No. No. Yeah, go Yakov. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick last, like, and and probably much more broad, abstract question. I think. I mean related to, to what you just commented on in the California context. Um, what you're describing, I think, like in its ideal form, as you put it, would, it would completely dislodge the centrality of home ownership in American political economy. And I think, you know, in the spirit of the social wealth seminar, I'm curious, like, if you could speculate a bit on the social um, and political implications um, of what you're describing. If, if part of what you're doing is, yes, yeah, substituting the centrality of um, home home ownership and well in the international political economy, but America as well. And, yeah. and Jack, can you tell us who you are? Oh yes, sorry. My name is Jack. Um, I work on the editorial team at um, JFI and run the Phenomenal World blog. Um, it would be you know, um, there's an economist at the St. Louis Fed, um, who I'm um, who always made this joke. Uh, that it's kind of insane that we've tied everyone's retirement uh, to a asset that's no, not to perhaps the world's most illiquid asset. And I think we, I mean, my personal theory is that in, at least in the United States, and I also think in Europe, populism is really a asset holders revolt. Um, that's just my crackpot theory of politics that like the, if the, that it's people who have like the people who vote for Trump are going to be are the people who have put all of have offset their income for years in exchange for house appreciation on their capital asset called housing and that's because and they are doing anything possible to keep inflation and keep new entrants at bay so that thing retains its values so i think if we can find an alternative and displacement it would just it would be pretty great it would be it would, I think, you know, make politics a little less hostile because you're then not tied to one thing, right, that you have to hold forever. I just think housing is a terrible idea as a savings asset. It doesn't, it, it's got all these problems, but I think that's a conversation for, I don't know, maybe another day. I think that requires its own hour. Of, <laughs> yeah, that's several hours. Several hours of like the extremely strange thing that you know financializing housing has done to at least the American political economy and also apparently the Brazilian one too. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but I've read some research on that. All right. Well, well, um, thank you so much, uh, Jakob. I think um, now we're we're at a, a, a good place to um, uh, to uh, to pause for this evening. But uh, it really has been a tremendous pleasure. Uh, I think this has been, you know, such a um, such a rich um, presentation and especially discussion, um, which is, you know, really what we're trying to um, to, to cultivate here. So I, I, I really can't thank you enough, Yoko, for this um, for this presentation and discussion. Um, just to, to briefly say in closing, um, we will be back in two weeks uh, when we will uh, be uh, turning kind of squarely to the municipal level and uh, hearing from Amanda Cass um, about. Uh, public pensions, specifically with a focus on municipal pensions in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, so certainly a pressing question and uh, an opportunity to uh, think uh, together uh, about um, something really important. Uh, so uh, I hope to see many of you there. And, uh, and just again, thank you so much, Jakob, and thank you to um, everyone for joining us.